It's with great pleasure that I welcome you here tonight for this evening's Artist Talk with Rachel McLean. Now, I'm sure for most of you, Rachel needs no introduction. Tonight's talk actually sold out in record time, and we had a waiting list of over 100 people. Um, so I will keep my introduction as short as possible. Rachel McLean was born in Edinburgh in 1987. She studied painting at Edinburgh College of Art, graduating in 2009. And it was at her degree show that year that I saw her work for the first time. It was one of those rare but extremely exciting moments at degree show where you have a certainty that you have encountered a future star. And so it has transpired. From gaining initial acclaim at New Contemporaries that year, she went on to have major solo exhibitions across Scotland at Generator Projects in Dundee, Collective and the Printmakers in Edinburgh, and Inverness Art Gallery and the CC in Glasgow. Throughout the development of her career, Rachel has established herself as one of the most singular and significant voices of her generation. By appropriating and deconstructing popular and familiar imagery and narrative, including fairy tales and reality TV, and crossing them with her acute political and social commentary, her works are at once alluring and unsettling constructed with intelligence and wit. She is a true auteur as artist, author, scriptwriter, director, actor, actors, editor, and numerous other roles beside. Her creative process and production is every bit as remarkable as the finished work itself. As an artist, a vocal advocate for artistic practice, and in her role as tutor at Edinburgh College of Art, she represents an influential and inspirational figure for a whole new generation of artists in this country and beyond. In 2005, her work Feed Me was part of British Art Show 8, which toured from Leeds to here in Edinburgh, then on to Southampton and Norwich. In 2016, she had a major solo show at home in Manchester and was selected to represent Scotland at the 57th Venice Biennale which began the journey that has brought us all here this evening. It was just under two years ago when Rachel was chosen for Venice to make a new work commissioned and curated by Alchemy Film and Arts in partnership with Talbot Rice and the University of Edinburgh. What followed was a thrilling, challenging, and remarkably short period of time to produce Spite Your Face, ready for its debut in the magnificent Chiesa de Santa Catarina in Venice in May last year. The rags to riches and back to rags again story, melding the classic Italian folk tale, The Adventures of Pinocchio, and the vulgar rhetoric emanating from the, night, from the 2016 US pres presidential campaign gained both critical and popular acclaim and was a real highlight of last year's Venice Biennale for many. Its unflinching political message, arresting visual power, and masterful sight specificity caught and ignited the attention and passion of nearly 30,000 visitors who dropped in or made a special pilgrimage to the deconsecrated church. On reframing the work this year for Talbot Rice, our primary aim was to honour and do justice to the remarkable staging in Venice. Unfortunately, we don't have a 13th century Romanesque church at our disposal. We do, however, have a splendid 19th century Georgian gallery. And under the masterful eye of our technician, Tommy Stewart and his team, with the help of some slightly bemused carpet fitters and the addition of a few choice soft furnishings, I believe we have done just that. And we are proud to present Spite Your Face to a whole new audience here in Scotland. In the past year, Spite Your Face has taken on an even sharper resonance with the Harvey Weinstein scandal, the Me Too movement, and the recent revelations around the harvesting of personal data, the themes of the work and issues explored have taken on a far more powerful, pertinent and urgent message. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who's been involved in the Scotland Venice project and realising the exhibition back here in Scotland. Um, it's been a fantastic journey to Venice and back again. In particular, I'd like to thank the Art Fund who are supporting this evening's talk. Of course, the return of Spite Your Face to Talbot Rice has extra special significance and is a true homecoming for Rachel back to the institution where she studied. 
we were especially delighted to mark the Venice opening with the news that university were set to acquire the first edition of the remarkable work, creating a fitting and permanent legacy for the project. On a personal level, it's been a wonderful experience working with Rachel throughout this project, and it's with great pleasure that I, that I introduce you to her this evening. Please join me in welcoming Rachel McLean. Thank you so much, Stuart, for the lovely introduction, and thank you so much, Talbot Rice, and everybody for coming. Um, I thought I'd start by giving you a very kind of brief, general overview of my work. Um, so I work largely in digital video, also digital print. Um, my work is almost entirely green screen, which if we got time as a process, I'll show you a little bit about. Um, but it means that all the worlds I create are kind of synthetic with unreal composited backdrops. Um, I'm also, until recently, the only actor in my work, um, so I make elaborate costumes and don um, uh, face paint and prosthetics to turn myself into a number of different characters that appear in the films. Um, the first work I thought I'd talk about was The Work Next Door, Spite Your Face. Um, so this was the piece that was made for Scotland and Venice, as Stuart mentioned, for the Venice Biennale last year, and this is the first time it's been shown in Scotland. Um, I love Venice. Um, I don't have the t-shirt, but I love Venice. Um, so from a very, a very early stage in the process, I was keen that um, Venice was kind of part of the work that I made for the Biennale. And um, one of the things that really intrigues me about Venice is the tourist culture. Um, I love tourist hat. Uh, I think my fascination started when I was studying drawing and painting at Edinburgh College of Art. Um, I loved the Royal Mile with its endless reproductions of Mel Gibson-like William Wallace statues and Loch Ness monster slippers and um, insta-kilts. Um, I think perversely what attracted me to it was the feeling that the tackiness and obviousness of tourist hat is somehow artistically off limits. Um, artists are supposed to uncover and investigate things that are not in plain view, so rather than just tackling what's there and what's obvious. Um, one of the first things that I was told in year one of Edinburgh College of Art was, don't paint the castle. Um, <laughs> almost every studio in the painting department offer, offers a glorious picture postcard impression of Edinburgh Castle, so it's an obvious temptation and was an immediate go-to for exchange students who clearly didn't get the memo. Um, we made sure to roll our eyes as they proceeded to render the castle repeatedly in pastels, watercolour and oils. Um, however, some way into my time at UCA, I started to change my mind. Maybe taking on the castle, the very thing that looms over us in every day and is endlessly reproduced on t-shirts and in snow globes. Um, these students were staring down the elephant in the room whilst we were all just kind of skirting around the edges. Um, maybe we shouldn't ignore the obvious but embrace it, work out what it is about it that's so seductive and worthy of reproduction, work out why culture has taken it to it with such endless fascination. Um, I attempted to approach Venice with something of the same spirit. Um, the first trip I took out in advance of making the work was very shortly after Brexit and in advance of Trump's victory. Um, the term post-truth was just coined um, as a way to describe this kind of odd, disturbing new political landscape. And I was looking to Venice for a way to um, explore some of these feelings of kind of anger um, and confusion that I had about this, I and many people had about the political situation. Um, so, uh, bingo. After some, but um, admittedly not loads of searching, I found the obvious thing, um, Pinocchio. And the moment I spotted him, he was everywhere, his creepy wee eyes following me around Venice. Um, a lot of my work uses fairy tales as a basis, um, and I like the way they exist without a kind of strong sense of authorship. They often evolve out of oral culture and morph to meet different needs. Their persistence is due to their ability to adapt. Um, they're also familiar, and there's a comfort in familiarity. I like to be able to draw in an audience with my work with something that makes them feel secure, so it makes them feel at home, um, makes them feel that they know and understand what's happening, and then puncture that comfort with something disturbing or strange or disgusting. 
Um, I was very privileged to uh, be able to, along with Scotland, the Scotland and Venice team and Richard Asheron, the curator, uh, select a venue for the exhibition. And as Stuart mentioned, um, we picked uh, Casey Santa Caterina, a deconsecrated church in Canareggio. Um, I decided on shooting the film in portrait format, so spite your face in portrait format, shortly after kind of seeing the space and thinking about how to occupy this altar um, in the church. And it's very luckily as well also perfect for the Georgian gallery next door. Um, I was kind of interested in what you could do with portrait format as opposed to landscape. Instead of left, right being the way that you navigate through space, it was about what's above and what's below. So it's much more of a kind of religious sense of heaven and hell. Um, in the film, you follow a Pinocchio-like character called Pick as he moves from a sort of deprived underworld to a more kind of glittery overworld. Um, there are elements of the church in Venice that are brought into the work. Sorry, I don't have a photo of this without me in it, so just ignore me in this picture. But you can kind of see how there's bits of, bits of the film are almost in the same room as you are watching the film. Um, so Pick grows up and kind of transforms during the film. Um, and like the Pinocchio character in the narrative, his nose grows. Um, it's, the idea is that it signifies, as in the original, lies and untruth, um, but it's also a growth in the film of a kind of phallic power and then eventually an abusive power. Um, as I mentioned, I wrote the script shortly after Brexit and Trump's entrance into the White House and was interested and also disturbed by how lies played into both campaigns. Um, there are two branded perfumes in the film, so truth and untruth. Um, truth is scarce and has magic qualities, while uh, untruth is mass-produced and ineffective. Um, much of my work is engaged with the power of narrative and myth-making in politics, national culture and personal identity. Um, and I'm interested in exploring how little disproving myths does to influence their power and their potency. Um, I have a suspicion that the way... Um, that we, our people, are much less swayed by analytical evidence and logical reasoning than we like to think we are. Stories are capable of taking the inconsequential chance incidents of life and giving them meaning, structure, purpose and grandeur. Spite Your Face follows and critiques a rags to riches narrative where you see Pick the central character enter a church, which um, is presented partly like a religious space and partly like a casino, um, and he wins a bet, which brings him into this kind of privileged overworld. Along the way, he's given a truth perfume bottle, which turns his skin gold, as well as a credit card. Um, both of them allow him to pass, as well as gain admirers in this elite society. Um, the, excesses, the successes don't last, though, as Pick begins to abuse his newly acquired power and fame. Um, the film is on a kind of continuous loop, um, so you're denied, I guess, in a conventional narrative, the satisfaction of an ending. Instead, there's this kind of claustrophobic, anxiety-inducing sense of pictures repeatedly making the same mistake again and again and again, so there's a kind of futility and pathos to it. Um, the female character in the film... Um, is intentionally complicated and kind of slippery. Um, she's at once a Madonna character or St. Catherine as a reference to the church in Venice. She's also a kind of mother figure, a lover at some point, a journalist. You see her both raped by Pick and also castrating him. And the order of that depends what, which way you watch the film. Um, the power dynamics between her and Pick are constantly in flux. Um, it was interesting for me to re-watch the film after Harvey Weinstein and the Me Too movement and notice how much more prominent this character and her narrative was within the story. Um, I think we're living through interesting times. Uh, the rise in feminism and prominent women identifying as feminists um, in the media at the exact same time as a kind of resurgence in old school patriarchal values. Um, in my hopeful moments, I think we could be living through the death throes of the patriarchy, where figures like Trump's are just, um, or the anti-feminists of the alt-right are just reactionary idiots gasping their last wee sexist breath. Um, however, in my less hopeful moments, I feel that the reaction against feminism could be a sign of how far we still have to go. Um, 
formally in Spite Your Face, I was interested in looking at ideas of truth within the image and how we picture the world. So the underworld in the film is a kind of non-perspectival um, Giotto-like space. Um, so kind of taken elements of it taken from Giotto paintings. And the overworld is a clean perspectival um, space which references, at least in this scene, uh, Piera della Francesca, the ideal city, and the sense of kind of one point perspective and this idea of scientific visual truths. Um, I don't know if this is interesting beyond just being geeky, but um, in visual effects and post production, to make something look real and truthful, um, you make it look like it's been shot through a camera. So you would add things like lens flares and dust on the lens and lens distortion to make it look truthful. Um, I think there's something of this to one point perspective where the world is only true or truthful if you imagine it seeing it through a lens. Um, so I won't show you a clip from the film because you can watch it next door and please do if you haven't already. Um, so I'm going to move on to talk about some uh, other recent work. Um, so I thought I'd talk first of all about um, It's What's Inside That Counts which is a 30-minute video that I made in 2016 and was originally shown in Home and commissioned by Home in Manchester. Um, it's What's Inside That Counts presents quite a different world, despite your face, but there's kind of similarities. Um, it's a world in which seems to be controlled by advertising and by corporate influ influence, and it follows, follows data pictured here, who's a figurehead for BU, a kind of data company. She's a sort of cyborg, Kim Kardashian type character. Um, data exists in a gated realm fell far away from the melting plague victims who roam the streets at once kind of zombies and protesters shouting, we want data. Uh, beneath the city lives a community of rats that look like grotesque, Disney Nickelodeon characters and speak in a strange disjointed language. Um, they've got a kind of disruptive agency in the film and act at once like ju junkies but also like hackers and they see them gnawing on data cables, seemingly living off information and the energy they get from it at the same time as being able to hack into the kind of networks of the world above. Um, the rats both seem to desire and want to undermine data and an attempt, attempt to kind of mainline or hack her network. Um, there's also a character called, uh, or I'm calling him Happy Man. Um, he's a sort of mindfulness guru for the tech industry, um, meets this world, wild, wild West cowboy who switches from being at some points violent and at other points um, uh, acts with compassion. Um, the characters in what's inside that counts are inextricably linked to technology and appear to live their lives through likes and selfies. They also look quite a lot like emoticons with kind of noseless faces and yellow skin. Um, I'm interested in the effect of social media on our identity and our sense of self and the idea that most of us now have these alter egos um, online presenting only the, only the best of ourselves with the hard edges, edges cleansed. Um, I might just have a bit of a ramble about stuff now, whilst I'll show you some images. Uh, but before I do, um, this was how it was originally shown, the film in home, so on a three-screen um, projection, and there's these little emoticons that have appeared in a few of my films with happy and sad, um, kind of cute, um, but in some instances rendered like in it's what's inside that counts as these kind of grotesque live-action characters. Um, I'll show you some prints that I made that were kind of expanded from the film as I ramble. Um, so these are part, some of the characters but brought into prints. Um, so I'm kind of interested in what a platform like Facebook or Instagram assumes or encourages about the human condition. So jealousy, narcissism, voyeurism, a sense that we're all individuals competing to present the most perfect life but depressed because everyone else seems to be having it better, more fulfilling, more beautiful, exciting, or a well, more well-rounded experience than us. It's keeping up with the Joneses slash Kardashians on a grand and anxiety-inducing scale. It's like we've targeted some of the most damaging human potentials and made a platform to exaggerate them. Um, alongside new, highly edit this new, highly edited social media identity, however, is also the database 
identity that's collected often without your knowledge by platforms like Facebook, an identity that's based on what you like, what you looked at, what you've bought. You're giving this information away for free and often without your knowledge in order that it can be sold to advertisers and encourage you to buy things or more recently vote for people. Um, the tech industry has been very clever in the way that it's allowed corporations and commercial influence to seep into all aspects of our online lives. Facebook doesn't tell you that it's a massive global advertising company. Instead, it talks about connecting you with the people around you as if it's just a benign force for social interaction. Um, it's what's inside that counts presents a glossy, computer-generated, candy-coloured world meant to seduce you. Um, however, there are cracks in the veneer which at times break down into a dystopian ruins. I feel in a visual and a metaphorical sense that the idea of outer gloss and inner rot permeates so much of our experience of capitalism. Um, the world and it's what's inside that counts, like our own, is permeated by ever-present advertising. Um, I'm increasingly concerned about the effect of this constant commercial presence in every aspect of our lives. My feeling is that the key to effective advertising is to stoke insecurities, to make, make people feel inadequate, that they're never quite good enough, while simultaneously serving you up an ineffective anecdote, antidote to the very anxiety that it's provoked. Um, we're constantly being presented with images of happiness, but as a way to provoke the exact opposite insecurity, anxiety, dissatisfaction. Um, if everyone was truly satisfied, truly happy, would we be so easily taken in by false promises of perfect skin and glossy hair? Does consumerism depend on dissatisfaction, depression, anxiety? And is that why the insecurity and narcissism generated by platforms like Facebook create such an ideal climate for advertisers? Um, I'm currently working on a new film called Make Me Up, and for this I've been researching a lot of makeup tutorials um, with female and female YouTube stars. Um, the phrase, it's what's inside that counts, is so omnipresent, and the women in the videos are always referencing um, the idea of inner beauty and giving advice on how to overcome insecurities, insecurities about your appearance or your body image. Um, however, it's often a sadly anxious message that's wrapped up with a world of superficiality, so makeup products, plastic surgery, flattering lighting and camera angles. Um, the more I watch these tutorials, I feel sad about the double bind that women, and often very young women, find themselves in where we are crippled by the pressure to look perfect and sexy and attractive, but simultaneously unable to talk about it in those terms. Instead, the achievement of beauty is increasingly about self-confidence and empowerment. If you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Women are in a double bind of being pressured to strive for superficial beauty and use, but being made by the very same culture to feel ashamed for wanting anything other than inner happiness. How are we to navigate this complex understanding of inner and outer beauty? Um, in many ways, I feel like we're living through uh, whoops, um, exciting times are exciting and important moment for feminism. It's back on the agenda and a lot of high profile women are declaring themselves feminists. And we have to credit the med social media to an extent with much of the rise in awareness, um, which was definitely not present when I was growing up. Um, but at the same time, I think that feminist values and radical ideas have got tangled into this kind of web of corporate interest and consumerism where being empowered is about knowing your brand and being able to com commoditize yourself and your ideas. Power is defined by having and making money. Um, I'm uncomfortable with this incorporation of feminism into capitalism. To imagine that an e equality between men and women can be achieved within a, si within a system that necessitates such grotesque inequalities seems to be a little too hopeful. Um, so I'm gonna show you a short clip from It's What's Inside That Counts, which moves from a sexually violent scene, just to warn you, to a Disney-style musical theatre number. So here we go. B. 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 Be. Be you. Be you. Be yourself. 
be yourself. Love yourself. Love yourself. Bring yourself into the present, the here and now. In two, four, one. Two, four, one. Two for one, two for the price of one. Two for one deals and offers. Two for one? No! Stop. Control yourself. <sighs> okay, okay. <sighs> control. 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 Self-control. Self. Self. Now remember, what is the secret to success? Focus. Focus. Clear your mind. Think of nothing. Nothing. Doing nothing. Now reach inside yourself. Deep inside. And find that strong, confident woman. Now free her. Freedom. F is for freedom. The freedom to be beautiful. Beautiful. Beauty. B. 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 Beauty is something that comes from the inside. Where it counts. Inside. Inside. Two. Four. One. Nothing. Doing. Nothing. Thinking. Nothing. Nothingness. Pay attention! Nothing. Nothingness. N n I said pay attention! Nothing. Fuck nothing! Nothing. You just sit there all day on your fat little ass doing nothing! Nothing. Nothing. Because when you're fast on the inside, you can do anything. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Stop! Why the fuck should I care about you? I earned it, you bastard. <laughs> Distracted, we forget to value the beauty on the inside, where it counts. What do you do when things go wrong? Oh, you get up and do it again! Yay! Again, again, again! Take a look within, underneath the skin, beyond what others see. What you find loving, kind, and free. Give a little smile and spend a little while on nurturing your soul. Inner beauty is the thing that makes us all feel. You wear your makeup or your hair. What 
else underneath needs care You'll find your true and lasting beauty there Apart, pick yourself up and do it again. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And again. Because what because when you're fast on the inside, you can do anything. Red loops and you see the full film, but that's just a clip. Um, I might just play the credits, but I'll switch the sound off. So, um, and I can introduce the next thing. I'm going to just very quickly introduce a couple more films so I can show you the clips. Um, so the next film I was going to talk about was is called Please Sir, and I made it in um, 2014. Um, the title is taken uh, obviously from Please Sir, and I have some more from Oliver Twist. Um, from Charles Dickens. Um, I made the work edition originally for a show in Glasgow at CCA. Um, I'll bring up the photo of it now. Uh, give me a sec. Um, okay, here we go. Um, so it was originally made for a show in Glasgow at CCA, and I was looking with a film at specifically British notions of class and social hierarchy, but also intend for these themes to be relevant in a broader context too. Um, the film is shown as a split screen, and you watch it kind of like you would watch tennis. So there's one screen at one end of the room and one screen at the other end, and you can kind of jump back and forth between them, but you can never see both at the same time. And you see the characters kind of look directly across the room at one another. Um, in the work, uh, I was looking specifically at representations of class and wealth, as well as poverty in the media, particularly in television and film, so kind of broad cultural narratives. Um, and unlike in Spite Your Face and It's What's Inside That Counts, the film is made entirely using found audio. So all the audio clips are real, but I, in different costumes, mime to them on screen. Um, the clips are taken from things like uh, Britain's Got Talent, Jeremy Kyle, Train Spotting, Downtown Abbey, and you jump between them in a slightly kind of channel changing way. Um, the main kind of driver, narrative drive for the film comes from uh, The Prince and the Pauper from the Mark Twain book. 
Um, and in case you're not familiar with the narrative, in a very potted way, it's uh, two boys are born in London at the same time. One's a prince, one's a pauper. And due to various circumstances, they swap places. The prince becomes the pauper and the pauper becomes the prince. Um, and I was interested in using that narrative as a way to kind of talk about ideas of class and also set it up in this very... Um, physically kind of binary way where you've got these two screens and these two kind of distinct worlds that interact. Um, so this is the popper, who's a kind of Oliver Twist in sportswear, and this is the prince, who's more of a kind of Tudor Stuart monarch. Um, I might just kind of flick through these so I can show you the clip. Um, there's also various sort of grotesque extras. I got quite into noses in this film. Um, and I was looking at quite a few different reference points, so things like Hogarth and Rowlandson, um, so kind of caricatures and trying to explore, create characters that felt and looked almost like drawn caricature. Um, and also looking at kind of traditional depictions of romanticised poverty. Okay, so I'll show you a clip. So in the clip you see it go from... Uh, a musical, all of, um, the musical Oliver Twist into Britain's Got Talent and then finally into Jeremy Kyle and it just kind of moves between the different audio clips. So here we go. So this is both screens on the one screen so you've got to kind of imagine what it would be like to see it um, in the proper installation but you can get the idea. Um, this is a 30 minute film too, so this is just a short clip from it. Before we take the lad to task, may I be so curious as to ask his name? I'm Callum Francis. How old are you, Callum? I'm 12. Okay, and <laughs> what's your act? Uh, well, I'm going to sing Consider Yourself from Oliver Twist. I had a feeling okay. you were going to say that. <laughs> Is that what you'd like to do, to be in the West End? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. So who in the West End do you aspire to be like, do you think? Um, I would say Dodger. Right, Dodger? The, the character in Oliver Twist. That... All right, your chance okay, in darling. the spotlight here. Callum, off you go. lovely about that performance was that it was very natural and unspoilt and you have a raw talent which I think you definitely need to keep. Uh, I think you've got <laughs> probably the cheekiest grin we've ever had on Britain's Got Talent without any doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever stop laughing or not? <laughs> 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 Why are you smiling? Don't know. Just hang on. You're smiling because you're nervous. See, I don't think it's funny. A few weeks ago or a few days ago, you mugged somebody at knife point. You right. think that's funny, yeah? No, I don't think it's funny. So tell me what happens. Tell me what you do. Rob them, take the money off them. And scare the life out of them with a knife. All right. But I'm not going to use a knife. Who do you approach? What do you do? Do you, do you target people? Do you think I'm going to go to this sort of place? Well, how, how do you work it out? Come on. People like you that look smart. People like me that look smart? Right. What do you mean, look smart? 
Go for the look and see that's got money. So what do you do? You, what, you lie in wait, you distract me? What, what do you do? Tell me, how would you mug me? Go on. Well, walk, 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 walk up, on. grab me and tell you what the money is. Then give me money or use some on you. So if I didn't give you my wallet, you'd stab me? No, it's all right. Um, so, next thing I was going to talk about was uh, Feed Me, which is an hour-long film that I made in 2015 and uh, was with Film and Video Umbrella, who commissioned it and British Art Show. Um, so, it was one of the first films I'd made that was kind of fully scripted and it moves between lots of different genres. So, you go from kind of fairy tale to musical theatre to drama to sort of horror and then back into a TV interview. So there's a feeling of it being quite channel changing. Um, I was interested in this film and looking at the idea of youth, so both um, literally um, in the sense of childhood, um, but more generally, generally related to a desire for the new, so for the young, the fresh, the emerging, the new iPhone, the new update, rolling news. Um, the film confuses and plays with the boundary between child and adult. And um, I play all the parts in the film, so I play um, children and I also play kind of older people too. And there's something hopefully kind of creepy and odd about that realisation. Um, the children in the film have these warped eyes that are a bit like um, kind of live action Disney's Frozen character. Um, but I like the fact that somehow if you make them live action, it's a little bit grotesque. And these are um, characters played by me, but with prosthetic makeup. Um, and there's a feeling of it all being in this kind of candy-coloured world. Um, I was looking, yeah, so there's these characters that are quite fairy tale -ish, so there's a fairy tale sort of witch character, as well as this beast who's partly um, a kind of care bear and partly a sort of ogre character. Um, I was researching quite a lot of children's TV when I made this and was kind of interested in how we fetishise and conserve a sort of privileged, gated off world of childhood innocence, a sort of mini utopia of the mind complete with day glow rainbows and perfectly manicured hillocks with love, lovely little friendly creatures living there. Um, in a general sense, I became interested in um, the desire for adults to regress to childhood and how this manifests itself. Um, so I was looking at things like... Uh, uh, big companies like Google, where their office looks a bit like a crash, um, as well as I think at the time there was like a big obsession with onesies, so like adults getting onesies for Christmas and wearing these kind of baby snuggle clothes, um, and also these sort of Starbucks cups, these big milky drinks that are in these sort of spill-proof baby cups. Um, so in the film, you see the adults in the world inhabiting this kind of space where. Um, all of the technology and things that they use are almost like um, infantilised baby toys. Um, and I was thinking about the idea that it's convenient for multinationals to present a kind of benign, innocent and saccharine mask, which um, masks a lot of the dodgy dealings beneath the surface. So everything you see in Google has that kind of um, childish, innocent, animated quality to it. Um, I might just kind of flick through a few of these and you can take what you want from them and then I'll get on to showing the clip. So uh, there's these um, characters in the film who are almost like um, gangs, uh, but they're gangs of kind of children that suck on these dummies with unhappy faces on them. Um, and there's also this sense of pretend in the film where there's things like, um, uh, you see the sort of finger gun appear a lot and sometimes it doesn't work, it's not a gun, and other times it actually functions as a gun. So there's the sense of that idea of childhood being this kind of um, preparation for adult or for reality and flicking between something being pretend and something being real. Um, I was also looking quite a lot at the idea of the sort of fairy tale um, ogre or boogeyman, um, but playing between contemporary readings of that and more sort of time old readings of it. So it came about, or I made it shortly after the Jimmy Savile scandal, so there was um, something of that in it as well as this bringing it into the fairy tale narrative. Uh, right, 
I'm really just going to flick through. Um, and there's also that sense of the child within the horror genre coming into the film, which is something I'm quite interested in, the sense of um, children and this slightly otherworldly child um, becoming this horrific character repeatedly in horror movies, the sort of otherness or fear that's embodied in our idea of childhood as well. Um, right, I'll show you the clip. Oh no, finally. Um, there's uh, quite a few sort of market research things that you see in the film where you've got these kind of happy and sad faces and these, um, this ball that has a kind of sad face on it that you see the character get as a free gift, but it's seemingly a free gift with strings attached. And when she squeezes it, it says, I'm too happy. Um, and I was kind of interested in that, I'm too happy, and 110% comes up a lot. That idea in a lot of my work that you're pushing things beyond the point where they're nice or beyond the point where they're pleasant. So I'm too happy rather than just happy and 110% instead of just 100%. So you take it at the point of ultimate positivity and then you almost tip it over the edge into something that's grotesque or dark or unpleasant. So I hope that the aesthetic has that feeling of being seductive, but there's always a sense of it just being pushed too far to the point that it becomes unpleasant. Um, OK, so I'll show you a clip from this. Um, this is a short clip, but the full film is an hour long. Um, and this clip kind of comes reasonably near the beginning of the film. I'm too happy! Wow! You Happy Jack Beast is so alive that you can really feed him! Feed me! Feed me more! You are hungry! I heart you! I heart you too, Happy Chat Beast! Happy Chat Beast comes with this magical free gift! I'm too happy! New Happy Chat Beast! Comes as shown, batteries sold separately, a Smile Incorporated product.
the light In the darkness out of sight I long for hope I long for the day when I can walk with head held high Up where people see the sky Instead I wait In cold desperation Like some wicked game I'm wrongfully condemned Longing to explain Longing for a friend Somebody who'll hear me out Who'll trust my plea without a doubt I long to feed The hunger it burns I long to be Out in the world up there I long to So I thought I'd show you a little bit of kind of the process that goes into my work. Hopefully this doesn't spoil the magic. <laughs> um, but uh, like I said at the beginning, all my work is um, made using green screen, which is a pretty simple, conce well, conceptually a simple process in that you just uh, shoot um, a character that's not wearing anything green against a green background and you take out the green and it gives you a kind of live action cutout. Um, and I think what has always appealed to me about it is it feels like you're using the moving image in the same way as you would make a painting or make a collage um, where you can bring different pieces together and create a composition um, and also create worlds which would be impossibly expensive to build for real as well. Um, so a lot of it involves, because it's me playing all the characters, imagining there's another character there. Um, so you've got to look at a stand or look at a wall and imagine that you're talking to somebody and then afterwards it all gets brought together. So there's a feeling that everything takes place. Um, couldn't be done in reality at all, has this kind of uh, existence only within the film. Um, and I think what's sort of fun about green screen filming as well is that you can have so much crap almost in the screen, like somebody's holding up a toilet, and then so much of the work is done in post-production. And I kind of love the post-production process. It feels a lot to me like painting, because you can um, mess around with things and change the position of a character in a frame, change the colours. You can really keep working on it in the way that you would do with a painting, so you're not locked in to an environment in the same way as you would with conventional shooting. Um, so that's original and in the final film. Um, and I don't know if this is interesting, but I thought I'd show you some uh, storyboards. Um, these, this storyboard is for this shot and this storyboard for this shot. Um, and with a lot of green screen shooting, you need to, especially because both of these characters don't exist in the same space, think about everything in advance. So the shoot is really a process where you're matching up day to day the same lighting and the same position and the same camera angle to make it work. Um, but for me it's really fun and it really feels like you have this whole um, space where you can go to town with your own invention and your own ideas and the things that you picture in your mind can become reality. So um, yeah, that's a little insight into the process. Um, I think that's me, apart from questions. So. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rachel, for a wonderful insight into your practice and your work. Um, as Rachel said, we do have some time for questions. Um, so we would like to open out to the floor if anyone would like to ask anything about Rachel's work. and. I'll just I'll ask you to just wait for the microphone so we can... Hi. Um, sorry. Um, 
I recently read The Art of Cruelty. I don't know if you know the book, but um, it talks about the, represent the relationship between the representation, the reproduction of violence, Good. especially in art. Um, and both of the film that you showed, or two of the film that you showed tonight, had a trigger warning, and especially this relationship to sexual violence. Yes, yeah. And I was wondering how you approach that in your work, um, and, and how you feel about this idea of, of reproducing, especially sexual violence on screen, um, especially in, in light of the Me Too movement and the things that you've talked about tonight. Yeah, no, that's a good question, thank you. Um, I think, um, yeah, for me it's important that um, there is a point where you feel palpably uncomfortable. And um, I was thinking a lot about, I guess, with the Me Too movement, the way that it's made visible things that are invisible. And I think there's such a prevalence of a kind of casual misogyny within our society. It, it's imaged everywhere. Um, you can't move for seeing misogynistic images of women. And there's a sense that you become accustomed to it and used to it to the point that it's invisible. And I want in my work for it to feel um, like it breaks through that and it's definitely uncomfortable to watch. And there's also the sense of it breaking into something that's kind of real and difficult. So um, that's what I hope uh, you get from it. And I also want it to puncture that sense that you're, you're brought into a world which feels maybe quite pretty and cute and lovely and positive, but then this sense of violence always punctures the surface of it. Just further to you know, on uh, using green screen, if hypothetically you were given a Hollywood kind of level of budget, would you, would you still want to use green screen for that kind of artificiality? Or if you were able to actually recreate, you know, in real life some of those scenes, would you? Um, oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, I don't know, I really like green screen. And I think there's something about the quality that you get from it that's just distinctly different from if you film something for real. You've got more control over it. And I also like the idea that there's a synthetic quality to all of the worlds I create. And especially, I think that's the case with prosthetic makeup and things as well, that you know that if you scratch the surface, there's nothing beneath it. And to know that it's really there and it was really shot in this environment that was built for a real, I think, is a different kind of feeling that you get from it. So um, I think if I had a bigger budget, I'd just do more, like, I don't know, fight scenes and explosions <laughs> and have a ship or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think I'd go more CGI rather than more um, building it for real. So. I think there's a question up near the back, actually. I was just wondering, um, you mentioned that you worked with like a team of like composers and like director of photography and stuff. And I just wondered like, do you approach them or do they approach you? I was just wondering because I, I perform to camera and it's just me. And I just wondered like how you approach that team. Yeah, it kind of um, came about partly the original time I went from going from just shooting like all the stuff I did at art college was just me in a bedroom with this wall I'd painted green. And um, I got this opportunity just shortly after I left college to work with Duncan of Jordanston, where they were setting up this kind of, it was, I guess, like opportunities for artists to work with film crews. And at the time, I didn't even think I wanted to. But then the minute I worked with this crew, it was incredible. And I realized how much more you could do working with other people and what that brought to the films. Um, so it's kind of been a process of just building a team out of various people I met. Um, I met quite a lot of people who were the same age as me when I graduated, but were going more in a film direction. Um, the DOP, I currently work with David Liddell, who's shot a lot of the last few films that I've made. Um, I met him through a recommendation from a friend, and he's amazing, and um, also really understands the way I work, which is a, quite an odd way to work in lots of ways. Um, so I think you kind of just gather a team through working with people by chance, liking them, and then um, you stick with them. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> And also, would you uh, continue to uh, play all the roles yourself, or 
Can you foresee? Uh, no, actually, I've, I've just shot a film which um, is called Make Me Up, and it's uh, a collaboration between NVA and Hopscotch, and um, it's going to be kind of like 70, 80 minute film that'll be um, hopefully on BBC Four in um, autumn time. Um, and that's, I am in it playing one role, but I worked with a cast of actors, about 13 women, um, which was great and it was so much fun. And um, I, partly it was born out of just wanting to try it and also born out of the frustration of trying to make a film where you can't actually see what's being shot whilst you're shooting it. So, um, so yeah, that's really exciting. And I think I, I kind of like this feeling of maybe I go between using myself and working with other people. Um, yeah. Just to follow up, how did that change your approach to the work? Because obviously when you're the only actor, you can ask yourself to do whatever you like, but when you're actually directing <laughs> yeah. another person, how does that change your, your thinking behind the work? Um, it's, it's interesting. I think you, you need to, at some level, you need to communicate things more, but then I worked with really great actors who think of things that you haven't thought of. So like, why would this character do this at this point? And what is it they're feeling right now? And you, when you write something, I think you can forget these things and an actor can bring that, bring so much with a performance that you alone couldn't bring. So um, yeah, I think for me, it's, it's really exciting. Um, as your work's already very well known, do you ever get worried reusing clips and imagery from your old videos? Like, is there a pressure to make new imagery all the time, or do you like using your old work as well? Oh, I don't know. Um, I think uh, I think if I don't know, maybe as an artist, you always want to be making new stuff. I feel like I don't know if this is the same for all artists, but like you have some ideal artwork in your head. And you think, oh, this time I'll make it. And then you make it and you're like, oh, it's all right. But, you know, I could probably do that better. <laughs> so yeah, I think maybe a lot of it's just trying to pursue something like the kernel of the same idea. But each time you're adding new things or you're approaching it in a different way. So I think it's partly my own compulsive need to make stuff. Um. <laughs> Hi. Um I noticed on oh, hi, <laughs> on social media, like on Instagram, you're not like super present. Oh yeah. And I was wondering if that's a conscious decision, and what you think about artists using Instagram as like a major platform. Um, it's partly conscious and partly I just don't know if I've got like the personality you need for being good <laughs> on social media. I find it quite odd to expose so much of yourself publicly, and I don't know if I'm also kind of. A control freak with my work where I like to feel like what you the message you're putting out is very carefully constructed and I think I probably can communicate better by making art than I can by tweeting or posting stuff but there's loads of artists I follow on Instagram and they're really funny and really interesting and take a really inventive approach to it so I would quite like one day to do a sort of Instagram project or something where it really purposefully took the medium and did something with it that was weird. I guess kind of like what Cindy Sherman's done with Instagram, where it's this kind of weird combination of her life and her art. So I think there's loads of potential, but I've just not really explored it. I'm a terrible tweeter. <laughs> I think there's time for maybe one more question. There's a hand up at the back. Hi. Um, this is a more kind of generic question, but um, we are currently in fourth year, and I was just wondering if you had any sort of advice for uh, like people like us that are about to graduate um, and kind of newly trying to establish yourself as an artist, kind of. Um, that's a good question. What advice? Um, I think I think you've got to do it because you want to do it. I think that's partly the thing with an artist. It's just that compulsive need to make things, and it's not. Your years after graduating can be really exciting, and I think there's good things to do, like try and meet as many possible people as you can. People have graduated from other colleges in the UK, and I think in Scotland you're really lucky because, at least in my experience, recent graduates are really well supported by the Scottish art scene, and there's a real interest in what's coming out of universities, and I don't think that's the case 
everywhere. So there's lots out there for you. But I think there's always like dark moments where you feel like, oh, geez, you know, I'm not getting paid. Why am I doing this? You're working a bar job. And you've just got to kind of keep in your head what it is, the reasons that you want to do it and keep that kind of compulsive need to make. Um, and I think that's sort of what sees you through as an artist, is just hanging on to the reason why you're doing it and not letting all that other stuff kind of get on top of you too much. That doesn't sound too negative, I hope. <laughs> no, it's good. <laughs> I think on that note, and I think it was quite a positive uh, vision for the future, um, Thank you so much, Rachel, for this evening's talk. It was really so uh, fascinating. Thank you all for coming out in such numbers. Um, it's really fa fantastic for us to see there's such an appetite for the talks that we do. And uh, can I just ask you all to well join me in thanking Rachel one more time for tonight's talk. <laughs> <laughs>